Okay, welcome back, everybody. And so now we're going to take um, take on the uh, SDN and network operations track. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first person we have speaking is Adrian Farrell, and Adrian is one of those guys who's a legend <coughs> at the IETF. Um, he's been involved in MPLS, GMPLS, SDN. He was routing director. He was a uh, chair of L2 VPN. He's co-authored uh, 70 RFCs. His first IETF was IETF. Hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of people have asked me, uh, how do you start getting involved in the IETF? How do you take the first step? Well, the first step that Adrian took was he actually started implementing MPLS uh, drafts. And then he, he had comments about them and uh, lots, of, lots of things he wanted to have them um, do. And then all of a sudden he found himself at the IETF. So without further ado, I give you Adrian. Thank you, Nalini. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to talk uh, about service function chaining um, and uh, give you a bit of a background as to what the IETF is doing. Um, so what is service function chaining? What is a service function? Um, how is the IETF uh, approached that architecturally? And then what are the protocol um, developments that the IETF has done and is still doing to support service function chaining? Um, so, yeah, why me? Um, I've been participating in, in the IETF service function chaining for uh, a long time, and um, that's in a couple of working groups. Uh, maybe more importantly, I was the area director who chartered the, the IETF work on service function chaining, and that's an interesting part of the process. So what happens is a group of people say, we think we'd like to work on this topic. And they find an area director and they talk to, to, to her and she says, well, that's not really a well-formulated problem space. Go away, come back with what you really want to do. Um, and we, we, we get a lot of, uh, of, of unicorns coming to the ITF. Here's, here's a wonderful idea. I want to make something new, but not a really precise definition. So that's cycled around a bit, just emails, and a few people wrote uh, basic internet drafts to describe the problem space. And then we held a meeting called a birds of a feather meeting, and that's a, a call to arms. Everybody in the ITF, if you're interested in this topic, come to this meeting, talk about it, and let's see if we can get a scope that is stuff we can really do protocol work that we can really engineer, not just some broad canvas with architecture diagrams. Uh, and then once that's all been done, the area director sits down and writes a detailed charter. This is what you will work on, and quite often this is what you will not work on, so that we understand where we're going. Um, also, why me? Uh, I'm actually, I, I've been sort of pushing gently from when I was an area director and continuing to get greater involvement from India in the IETF. The reasoning in my mind is that a huge amount of the software <coughs> that builds the internet is produced in India. And that comes then back to what Nalini said about how I got involved in the IETF. I was implementing. I was implementing uh, protocols that were still internet drafts, they were not RFCs, it was uh, a fairly rapidly moving landscape, and the internet drafts were written quite badly. Um, uh, never make the assumption, by the way, that it's your understanding of an internet draft that is broken, it's almost certainly the author's inability to communicate. Um, so I was reading these drafts, trying to write code, and saying, but that's, that's ridiculous. How's that supposed to work? And I, who do I ask? Where do I talk about this? I discovered that there were mailing lists in the IETF. I discovered that if you sent constructive, polite questions to those mailing lists, people answered you. If you had an idea and you sent politely, 
here's a, here's a block of text that would really explain this feature if you put it in a draft. The authors of the draft weren't just thankful, they were pathetically thankful. They were just delighted that you were doing their job for them. And that's how I first got involved. I, I was pointing out spelling mistakes, grammar errors, asking questions, supplying suggestions. Uh, and, and then I went to my first IETF meeting and I wore a shirt and tie for one, one morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a photo would be good. I think that my first ITF meeting was probably before um, the Polaroid camera came out. So, um, ah, what else? I write books of fairy stories. Everybody has to have a hobby. I write fairy stories. And that, I think, uniquely qualifies me to talk bullshit. <laughs> so, uh, service function delivery. Um, Service functions used to just appear as bumps in the wire. A firewall is the classic. Uh, as far as everybody is concerned, there's a wire from a CE to a PE, and the traffic's just flowing over that, and nobody is actually aware that the wire is plugged into one side of a firewall and comes out the other side, and the firewall processes. The next step of evolution of that was to put the uh, service functions in a, a, a dedicated local device that was port attached. So the traffic would come in, say to a CE, would get fibered out or come out of a piece of copper into some uh, attached device, processed, and go back in through another port uh, and get forwarded onwards. Um, Essentially, that type of device is also uh, invisible to the traffic. <coughs> but there are some limitations to, to the way that works. Um, there are, in that model, there are a huge number of physical devices deployed. And that's kind of good for the vendors because every, every site has got um, a number of these boxes but they are massively underused. Um, typically, the traffic going in and out of a site uh, has peaks, and the device is specced to handle that peak, and most of the time it's not doing much. Um, you often end up with multiple devices uh, at any uh, point, because each one provides a different function, and so you need um, to, to plug in a, a set of them. It's really hard to upgrade those devices as well. Uh, you might be able to do software upgrades on them, but if they're doing stuff in uh, silicon, then, well, you're, you're pretty much stuck. Um, uh, and so that may involve physical visits to every site in the, in the whole network to upgrade all of the functions. And then the management of those many, many millions of devices is uh, honestly a nightmare. Um, uh, with a very, very high chance of mismanagement. So what do we do? Well, we put those functions somewhere off-site, somewhere uh, remote, and we do the same trick of port attachment, but we make that port really a tunnel uh, across some network to um, uh, a, a remote site. So we've sort of got this remotely provided, locally attached feature. Um, uh, and, and the packets are, uh, are going seamlessly uh, that way. It's um, not necessarily a good technique for load reduction, because if you, if you look at the figure, um, there's only this one physical link. So the traffic from outside is coming in over the link, going back on the tunnel, coming back on the tunnel, and then being delivered. Um, and there are some uh, curious security uh, features of that as well, especially if the function you're trying to provide is a security function, and you're sending the packet back out over the internet to have it checked, and then it's coming back to you over the internet and getting corrupted again. Um, but we can build on that model uh, and use the data center. So what a data center does is allow you to take a service function and not put it in a, uh, a physical dedicated box, but spin it up on a server as a piece of software. Um, 
You can place them off path, of course, uh, because the data center is very unlikely to be on the path. Uh, and this gives you some great cost-effective uh, scaling. Um, the, instead of having a physical box for each flow, you can have one logical uh, piece of software handling multiple flows. And uh, then you can flexibly scale when that um, implementation is overloaded. You can just spin up another instance, spread the traffic between them, and on you go. Uh, very quick. Highly agile as well, because if you have a, a fix to your service function or um, uh, a new feature to add or a whole new service function, it's just software in the data center, uh, and we know how to do that. And we can even um, roll it out in a phased way between um, uh, instances. Uh, the management, well, I've said that the management in the data center is simple. Um, it's not quite simple, but it's a lot more simple because all of the uh, instances of the service function are there in the data center, and an orchestrator knows where they are and can um, manage them in a, in a sort of, um, holistic way. Um, and lastly, and this is where service function chaining comes in, in the data center you can start to build sophisticated sequences of functions that you want implemented in a particular order and they're all there in software and uh, you don't have to ping the packets all over the place because you can put all the service functions on the same server um, and you can do all sorts of clever stuff. Um, so Let's digress a little bit before um, looking at what the ITF has done and, and talk about the real use cases for service function chaining. Um, most of the use cases for service functions are pretty simple. Um, a firewall. I think we know what a firewall is and what it does. Um, a, a, and, and it's just a simple, go, go check this packet, yes, it's okay, send it onwards. Um, a load balancer has the job of distributing subflows uh, in the network. It's a really fairly simple uh, function. Um, TCP proxies, kind of terminate a session, do some stuff to the payload, send it on, or if they're a little devious, just change the payload within the session. Um, they're also as a, as a concept, fairly simple. Uh, and the last one I listed was endpoint selection, which is sort of like um, load balancing, um, particularly useful for dual-homed CEs or dual-homed sites. Uh, and um, when, you, when you want to decide remotely where to enter a site, you can, um, uh, you, you can use a, a service function for that. So these are not complicated sequences of functions. They are typically one or two functions. Um, and that means that everything else I'm about to say could just be over-engineering. It could be a case of um, a bunch of excited engineers coming up with a great way of doing something that actually nobody wants to do. Um, if that's the case, it would not be the first time it had happened in the ITF. Uh, in fact, I think the if you look at the RFCs, um, in, in all 8,500 RFCs, you will find that, oh, maybe half of them describe things that never happened. <coughs> Gin, by the way. Um, so it, it's possible that this is, is doing something that um, is still looking for a, a use case. But there is... Um, a good example in mobile connectivity that maybe needs more uh, in the way of chaining. Um, so the, the example here is that uh, a call is coming in, you have to derive the caller ID, apply the billing for that caller ID and the type of call they're doing, um, do specific call-based access, are you allowed to call that number, are you allowed to do this thing on the network, um, uh, go through parental controls, go through a firewall, and finally deliver the traffic. So that all sounds like 
uh, a good sequence uh, of, of things and there's uh, a nice internet draft out there describing the mo mobility use case as for service function training but don't we already see this already done by 3GPP? Is it something that needs to be in the IP layer? Um, so, <clears throat> what's happening in the ITF? There's a working group. There's always a working group. It's called SFC, which is good, because not all working groups have a name that's obvious, but this one is. Um, uh, it was chartered in 2013, Okay, so that's five years ago. What's it achieved in five years? Uh, well, it's achieved five RFCs. So this is not stellar, rapid turnover of work. And I think that that slightly indicates that the industry wasn't pushing hard and demanding it at the time. Uh, if I compare that, if I go right the way back to the MPLS, we, uh, we were spinning drafts uh, every three weeks as people wrote code. We were having uh, interim meetings. We were having tests of, uh, of implementation and uh, pushed out RFCs pretty fast for actually a bigger piece of technology. So it's happened at the speed that it was driven at by the people who were participating. We have a problem statement, an architecture, an encapsulation, and some minor extensions. And then there's a little bit of um, more interesting work uh, in progress, and there's the um, mobile use case. Have you noticed that when you're presenting, you tend to point at the screen, not at the, the laptop? Right. Um, so let's talk about terminology, uh, and then everything else will fall into place. Um, a service function. So I've already been talking about service functions. What was I talking about? Um, it's a function responsible for specific treatment of packets. Um, it can be physical or um, virtual. Uh, it can act at multiple layers of the protocol stack. So I had an example, TCP proxy. Um, I've recently been talking to people who want to stamp uh, video as it comes through so that, um, for example, if, you're, if you've bought a video stream and it's coming to you, it should only be delivered to the person who's paid for it. It shouldn't be being spammed out into the internet. Um, or it could be right down at the IP layer um, uh, checking uh, for DOS attacks. Um, a service function chain is simply an ordered set of abstract service functions. So it's not pointing at individual implementations. It's saying, I want to do a firewall and a load balance. Uh, or I want to do a TCP proxy followed by a firewall. That, that's, that's it. Um, and it's applied to a set of packets where a set is basically a flow. So you might take the five tuple, the typical five tuple, and say, this is what I want to apply uh, this chain to. Or you might say, everything that comes in this interface. That, that's uh, the level. Um, a service function path, and basically from here onwards, we'll talk about SFPs rather than SFCs. An SFP is a specific instance of a chain. So, um, it allows you to control, uh, yes, I've got to do this service function, but I want to use a firewall from, I don't know, uh, I won't pick a company, company X, and I want to use a load balancer from company Y, uh, and I want to do this thing um, in a virtual instance in a data center, uh, and it gives you that much specific control um, of location and quality. Um, and you. As for the service function chain, you apply it to a flow or a subflow. Um, and then one last uh, term is the service function forwarder. And this is a kind of um, uh, router in the service function layer. It's the thing that's responsible for getting a packet on a service function path from one service function to the next one. Um, and we'll have a picture of that, I think. 
Yeah. So, um, packets are starting at the sources. Um, they come to a classifier. The classifier's job is to work out which service function path this packet should go on. So it's essentially looking at the flow details and saying, OK, I've been programmed. I know what to do with that packet. It's going to go on this path. Um, and then we tunnel, or probably directly connect to the surf first service function forwarder. And it says, right, I deliver to the function that's local. Um, and there may be multiple types and multiple instances of any one type. I deliver to that, packet comes back, I now tunnel to the next service function forwarder along the service function path, delivers to the function, tunnel again, and the last step is, okay, I finish the path, push it on out to the destination. Um, yeah, I think I covered that. So, what this brings up is a need for encapsulation, because when a packet arrives at a service function, the service function has to know which local service function, sorry, this, when a packet arrives at a service function forwarder, the forwarder has to know which local service functions do I deliver this packet to. Um, and, and maybe in which order, because there may be multiple local service functions. Um, so it's got to be, it, there has to be some way of the service function forward and knowing this information. Uh, and then when the packet has been processed, it's got to know where to send that packet next, which is the next service function forwarder on the path and which tunnel to use to get to it. And then you want a few other little things. You want loop prevention, because you don't want a packet going out in the network, doing a local service function, going out, coming back round again, doing the service function, going out, coming round. OK, so you need some form of loop prevention. And you can't use the underlying payload protocol for that, because the service function is invisible. It can't touch the payload packet. It can't change the TTL. Um, and we don't want to do classification. Remember, classification is the business of looking at the packet to work out which path to put it on. We could put that everywhere in the network, but it's expensive. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's doing quite sophisticated DPI. So um, we, we want to, to offload that. And that, that suggests um, the need to do some specific encapsulation for uh, service function forwarding. Oh, I put arrows on. Oh, there we go. Um, so to address this, the IETF invented the network service header, the NSH. And that's out now as an RFC. Um, what it works on is the assumption that um, anything we do for service function training needs to be completely unaware of what it's carrying, what the payload is, and completely unaware of, of what networks it's passing through, what the tunneling mechanism is. So it's, it's a, an in-between encapsulation. Um, and actually, we required them, although it's basically used uh, between, well, sitting above layer three, uh, we actually required them to, to make this NSH work at any layer. So you could put it up there above TCP or, or whatever. It's just an encapsulation. Um, we also wanted it to be very lightweight because you don't want to be throwing lots and lots of bytes on top of um, the data. Um, it had to address those requirements we've already talked about, um, but allow the full complexity or potential complexity of interesting paths and service functions. Um, so what does it look like? Um, there on the left, the transport is above, the payload is below, and the NSH is, is slotted in between, inserted. And it consists of, uh, of a set of units, uh, a base header, a service path header, and some optional extension headers. Uh, the base header 
it, well, it begins to look pretty much like any um, protocol header. It's got a version number, and guess what? There's only version zero, and probably there will only ever be version zero, but we are future-proofed. Um, what else has it got? It's got a TTL, that's so that we can get rid of our loops. It's got a length, so you know how much more header is coming. Um, uh, a metadata type, we'll talk about metadata in a minute and a next protocol. Why is it useful to have a next protocol? Well, when you reach the end of the chain and you remove the NSH, you need to know how to process the payload in order to forward it. Uh, it's also slightly useful if you're a service function, that maybe you're a service function that can process Ethernet and IP. This will give you a clue. Um, so the base header is mandatory. The service path header is also mandatory. And hey, who knows why they're two headers rather than one block header, but that's the way they wrote it. Um, it's got two fields in it. It has a service path identifier. Okay, this tells us which service path the packet's on. So now we know, if we're a service function forwarder, now we know what context we're processing in. And it's got a service indicator which tells the service function forwarder which is the next service function to process. So this is like telling us how far along the path we are. And if you take the two things together, you know exactly what you should be doing next. And then the extension headers um, are intended to be able to do anything. So far, the only definition is for metadata that we will come to later. So, given this, what, what do the different functions do? Well, the first thing is the classifier, and the cl gets the packet, works out which SFP it belongs to, and then imposes the NSH. At the moment, it doesn't have a transport header to worry about, so it's just putting the NSH on top of the payload. Um, it sets the SPI, I'm going on this path, it sets the SI to indicate the first service function on the path. It sets the TTL appropriately. That's probably, it knows the length of the path. Why would it set it to anything longer than the length of the path? Um, uh, and it sets the next payload to say what the, po the, the next protocol to say what the payload is. And then off we go. It's now just a, a standard routing thing. I'm going to the next SFF, I'm going down a tunnel, I put the transport header on, and off the packet goes. So we get to an SFF. Receives a packet, um, looks at it and says, uh, um, which, service function, which service function path does this packet come on? Now you could, Remember port attached service functions. You could look at the tunnel and say this tunnel identifies the path. However, that doesn't really scale. It, it, essentially, it scales in the lab. It doesn't scale in the field because you might have many millions of service function paths. You don't want to put them down separate tunnels. You want to bundle them in one tunnel. So don't worry about the transport tunnel. Strip the header. Finished. Um, now. Do the TTL processing on the NSH, uh, discard the packet if you've gone to zero. And then use the uh, SFI, hmm, use the SPI, that's the first typo. Um, use the SPI SI to, to find out which is the next service function to, to, to deliver to. Send the packet um, uh, if it's for local processing. Um, pass the packet with the NSH to the SF. We'll come to that on the next slide. Uh, hopefully get the packet back. Um, remember, you might not get the packet back because it might be a firewall, and the firewall may just drop the packet. Uh, when you get the packet back, loop. Move on to the next service function instance. Is that, is that local? Yes, process again. Is it not local? OK, work out which is the next service function forwarder just like the classifier did, um, impose the transport header, and on we go. So what is the service function doing? Um, it receives packets from the service function forwarder, um, and those packets have the NSH in place. 
So the service function can check the NSH. It can look at it and say, yeah, that's right, I am supposed to be on this path, everything's good, or it could just trust the forwarder and, and work on it. It steps over the NSH, finds the payload packet, and does its usual, whatever its, fu its um, function is, modify, discard, check. Um, uh, so the results may be packet's okay, or packet needs to be modified, or packet is quarantined, or an alarm is raised, or discard the packet, or whatever. Um, and if it, the packet's okay, and, uh, or has been modified, and we're continuing, the NSA has to be updated. So the SF does one extra thing. It goes to the service indicator, the service index in the header, and it decrements it. So it's basically saying, I've done it, it's now somebody else's turn. And that means when the packet gets back to the service function forwarder, it can look at the index to see who the next person to process is. Um, and then the service function returns the packet to the service function forwarder. It's the same forwarder. Okay, all the, f all the routing, all the forwarding across the network is done by the forwarders, not the service function. So the service functions are just spikes out of the forwarder. Um, a wrinkle. Suppose you've got a legacy service function. Uh, and that's not uncommon. In fact, every service function deployed today is a legacy service function. Suppose you've got one of those. Uh, it uses port attachment. Uh, it expects native packets, and it doesn't know what an NSH is. But we've just des decided that the service function forwarder sends a packet with the NSH in place. So we need uh, a thing called a proxy. Uh, and the proxy has the job of stripping the NSH, forwarding the packet to the service function, getting it back again, reimposing an NSH. Um, it had better be stateful, it had better be port based. But apart from those things, um, everything's very uh, easy and straightforward. And if I was implementing, I would put this SFC proxy box inside the top of the service function forwarder. I wouldn't build a separate box for it. Uh, okay, I mentioned metadata before. And metadata is um, a cause for a huge amount of noise and discussion in the SFC working group. Um, metadata is essentially information about the packet that is carried in the packet or along with the packet. Um, and this may be derived from the packet. For example, you could be hashing the five tuple, and that's a, a piece of metadata. Or it could be that you do some uh, really funky DPI to find out what the payload actually really, really is. Uh, and once you've done that, you want to store that somewhere and pass it with the packet so that subsequent um, points on the path don't have to do the same DPI. Um, uh, or it could be function that's been generated by some service function that you've already gone through. And caller ID is an excellent example. As the packet comes along, you work out the caller ID, you put that in the packet, and then the next place, which is billing, knows who to bill. Um, Generally, it's there to help service functions execute their function. Um, uh, and, and as I said, it could be regenerated at every point by every service function, but that would be wasteful of processing. Um, so a, a question, um, when a classifier works out um, which service function path to put the packet on, it does that by doing some munging of the packet, it then um, generates the SPI, the service function path indicator, and puts that in the NSH. That's metadata, but it's already in the NSH. So what we're talking about is uh, additional information that's specific to a particular flow or use case rather than uh, generic stuff like the SPI. Um, 
And there are some use cases that have been proposed, but most of them, when you dig into them, are, I think, questionable. Um, and metadata is, is this hammer looking for a nail. It's a really great tool if only we could find out what we want to use it for. Um, uh, and maybe you can um, split the, the, the requirements for this uh, down into, into these three categories, uh, which are per packet metadata. So you do this on every packet, um, and you store the information in every packet that you're sending. Uh, per flow metadata, so uh, this, is, this is some information that applies probably to the five tuple every time. Um, and it's enough to say, look, I know the five tuple, and therefore I can map from that to the metadata. And I don't need to send the metadata in every packet. And my, my personal favorite is per SFP metadata. So this is extra information that applies to every packet on a service function path. Now I, don't, I really don't need to transmit this through the network very much. I can send it when I program, however I program the forwarders and the service functions. I can say, whenever you see this SPI, go dig out the metadata. Um, there's a draft, and it's again back in the mobility use case um, that talks about um, metadata requirements. But um, as you see, this is still a working group draft. It's nowhere near being an RFC. Um, so we, at the moment, we've got the ability to send metadata, but um, no clear understanding of why we would send it. How do we encode it when we do? Well, you may remember that there was a metadata type field in the NSH. Um, that, at the moment, takes uh, two potential values. One means there is a fixed 16-byte extension header present. Uh, two means that there's a variable length header present. Uh, and that's just got a, in, within it as a type and a length that we know. And beyond that, it would be defined in every different uh, use. Um, the type two, I think, is, uh, is a concern, because this is allowing um, arbitrary amounts of data to be injected between the payload and the transport. Um, that can give you MTU problems. That can give you parsing problems, especially if you're trying to parse in silicon and you've got a whole set of TLVs of variable length that you have to step over before you can find the payload. Um, and one other thing of clever stuff you can do. The classifier, right? We had the classifier when you entered the network. Well, actually, you can put the classifier anywhere, or you can have multiple classifiers. Um, and this allows your service function path to have forks and deliberate loops and jump over functions. Um, and that choice can be based on what's happened. In particular, if a service function discovers something strange, it can say, let's send this packet off on a different branch of the service function path. Uh, so my example here is a, uh, a firewall. Um, all the packets go to the firewall. The good packets simply go back and on they go. Uh, suspect packets get moved to a different chain to be analyzed and logged, and maybe that will say, oh, no, the packets are actually OK, really, and then they want to go back onto the path. Or it may say, um, this is something really strange, and we need to send it off to a, um, a for deeper analysis. So um, what the NSH effectively allows you to do is just get in there and modify the SPI. So be somewhere else, be on a different path. Or go in and modify the SI and say, uh, skip over three hops and continue. Uh, all right, OAM. Just like we heard this morning, security really ought to be factored into protocols from day one. So should OAM. And guess what? Um, the NSH does not include OAM from day one. So 
um, we're, we're struggling at the moment to work out what we need and how to do it. Um, we need to know, is the SFP up? Which service functions are on that SFP and in which order? Uh, did the packet actually get, go through those service functions? It's particularly important in security. Uh, and in what order did that happen? Uh, and maybe you want to know which instances of a service function were used for that packet, because maybe there's a bug in one instantiation. Um, uh, we can do a fair amount of that with injected packets, um, but they don't tell us how individual data packets are processed. So the current uh, proposal is using uh, in-band OAM, which is a, a generic solution suggested for OAM in multiple protocols, but they're applying it for service function chaining um, and probably using an NSH extension header to carry it. Uh, it's, got, um, it's got issues because it causes MTU problems as well. The amount of information gathered along the path may grow, um, especially if you have to do digital signatures that each function has, has been executed. Um, so, uh, why, why would you not use the NSH? Um, well, you have to do packets at line speed in service function forwarders. Again, it's easy in the lab when you've only got a few packets flying around. It gets harder in the, uh, in the real network, so you might well need new silicon for a new encapsulation. As I said before, you're probably going to use uh, service function proxies before you can delete, uh, before you can deploy a lot of this. Um, metadata makes processing hard, uh, lacking OAM, and this thing that I mentioned before, the service function decrements the, the SI before it sends the packet back. Well, that's kind of clumsy, because it means that the SIs need to be um, contiguous in the definition of a, of a service function path. If they're contiguous, you can't insert anything extra into that path without redefining the whole path. So um, it's, it's a bit uh, clunky. So what, well, what else might you do? Um, well, it's the IETF, it's engineering, and therefore the nice thing about standards is we have so many to choose from. Um, there are really um, good reasons to let that happen. Let the, the SFC experiment take place, let people work out what they really want to do with it. Uh, and um, as Yakov Rector used to say, let the market decide which is the right approach to, to build. Um, so I've got some brief slides about three um, possible approaches. Uh, L3 VPN. Um, the L3 VPN shown in the top of the picture, it supports multiple instances of a VPN on the same network. Um, it uh, routes outbound traffic um, across to a remote PE and then uh, uses a VRF. And uh, for inbound traffic, well, that's easy because it's port based. If you compare that with um, a service function chain, you can do pretty much the same thing. You can use the VPN label to identify the service function path. Um, you can uh, classify traffic um, into a, uh, a service function path and send it to the next PE, which is a service function forwarder. So you're just using an IP address within the VPN. And then the next service function forwarder will look up who do I send to next? Next IP address within the VPN. And, and so it goes. Um, and um, the service functions themselves are port attached. And well, you know what? Layer 3 VPN is port based. So it kind of works nicely. That is deployed. Uh, alternative two, you could use MPLS labels. Why might you do that? Well, we already have routers that do MPLS. 
So the step up to service function chaining is easier than implementing an NSH. What you need to do is somehow map all that stuff from the NSH into uh, a label stack. Uh, and what we did, and I say we because I'm one of the authors, and this draft is in working group last call, ending on the 1st of November. So if you have a problem, shout. <laughs> um, what we, what we do is identify what information we really need to know, uh, and that is the, um, I think I've got this, yeah, the TTL. We need the TTL. Well, we can use one of our um, label stack TTLs. Uh, we need an SPI, so we use a label for that. And we need a service index, so we use a label for that. And then we're done. So what have we discarded? We've discarded the version number. I said probably we'll never use it. Um, we've discarded the length. Well, we don't, we don't need that because we've got a fixed length, two labels. We've discarded the MD type, and I've got a slide for how we do handle metadata. And we don't need next protocol because it's MPLS, and in MPLS, we kind of know the context uh, for the next protocol. Um, I think I just talked through this slide. Yeah, there, there's a, a, a slight limitation in this approach. In the NSH, the SPI is uh, three octets, and here we've only got 20 bits, so there's a, a little bit of a limitation of how many service function paths you can support in the network. I reckon two to the 20 is good enough for today. Um, we can skip that. So metadata in the MPLS approach, what we've um, decided is we should not even try to carry per packet metadata. We should not put metadata in the packet with the data. It doesn't work well with MPLS. MPLS expects a short shim header and then the payload. So we've defined uh, a special purpose label that says, here comes metadata label. And the metadata label is an index into a store of metadata. Now, that means you have to populate the store. Um, so how do we do that? Well, you could do it out of band. You could have a central controller push metadata down to the service functions or the service function forwarders. Or you can use in-band, you can send packet along the same path as the data, but this doesn't carry user data, it carries metadata only. And so there's a little mechanism how to do that. You put the same uh, SPI, SI labels in, so it follows the same path, and then you put a, a, a label, a special purpose label that says, there's metadata here, not user data. Don't try to process it as user data, it's magic. Uh, you put the same index label in so that you know how to store it and then follows the metadata. Again, hammer looking for nail. Since we don't have a use case for metadata, doing all this, um, and this was most of the work of the draft, is, is, is possibly a waste of our time. Uh, segment routing. Segment routing is this source controlled approach. Um, to uh, packet routing, uh, where you impose a, a stack of hops, um, and it works for MPLS and IPv6, and you could potentially use it for service function chaining, because remember, what you're doing with a service function chain is specifying a sequence of service functions to, to pass through. So you could put those in as a, a source route in a packet. Um, that means you don't have to put state in the network, um, and it allows you to vary packet by packet, even on the same flow, which functions you go through. Um, I would say that f if you have a long service function chain, this might be exciting because you might have a very long list that you have to push, but as I said early on, our examples don't suggest that there are many service functions. Um, what else? Control and management. So we have to answer some questions. How do I configure the service function instances? Um, how do I 
know where they are? How do I reach them? Which service function forwarders uh, connect to them? Um, what are their capabilities? Um, how do I know where the service function forwarders uh, themselves are? How do I reach them? Um, what tunnels and addresses do I use? How do I actually build these service function paths? Um, what, what are the service function paths and what traffic should I put on them? Uh, and lastly, how do I tell the classifier about those rules? So, uh, it's, it's, it's a network. We have the dichotomy of centralized control and distributed control. Um, a lot of this feels like a TE problem. It's an overlay network, service function forwarders connected by tunnels. Uh, we need to do path computation to build the service function path, and we need to steer traffic. Uh, so I think you achieve this with a combination of uh, distributed control and um, central control. So you plan and you configure centrally, you discover using discovery protocols, and then you program uh, using routing protocols. I think there's a role for something like a PCE or, an, or a service function orchestrator. Um, uh, and um, if you look at the L3 VPN approach, you see that the routing is edge to edge. Uh, and that makes BGP seem like a good idea. Or it did when I was working at Juniper. Um, uh, so there's a slide about uh, the BGP control plane. You can go and look at the draft for all these details. And now I get to shout for the last um, three minutes, 28 seconds. Um, you can look at the draft for all the details. Uh, interestingly, this work is done in the BESS working group. BESS is BGP-enabled services. So it's not IDR that does BGP. It's not SFC that does service function chaining. It's... Um, it's, it's in this working group that is dedicated to uses of BGP for special things. I have a slide um, in there, and uh, the slides, I guess, will be available to you all, giving you some pointers to working groups and drafts. Um, notice that this one topic, service function chaining, is hitting uh, four working groups at the moment. Um, as it gets into operations and management, it will probably hit another working group as well. So um, never have the idea that your topic fits neatly into one slot. Sometimes it does, but quite often it gets spread across working groups. And questions? I guess microphone. Yeah, oh, it's a fight. <laughs> yep, I'm just... Yeah. Can we have the microphone up? Sorry. Uh, hi, Adrian. Uh, Adrian, what do you feel like, you know, uh, why the control plane, for me, like being part of the SDN and network operations, that was the part which is, I think, very key for this to work. Like, we nailed the work, we did the NSH, we did the MPLS encapsulation, we know how the packet will move. But I think the key is how would we control it? So. In ITF, especially when the work of, like, let's write down the requirements for what the control plane was worked, that kind of get dropped. So I wanted to know maybe if, as, as an AD, past AD hat, what do you think should be the right approach to do control plane work for something like this NSH? Yeah, so I think what happened was that there was uh, uh, two groups of people. The people who were working on forwarding planes um, they were silicon houses or uh, people who were deeply embedded in router vendors. And they were just pushing on with the NSH. On they went. And there were a few uh, operators who were looking at how do I build this, how do I deploy it, who started to work on the requirements for control. But they couldn't get traction because the people who were building the silicon didn't care. The people who were building the routers really wanted to sell their own router-based system. So company X wanted to sell a controller for company X's forwarding, and they were doing clever stuff anyway. They weren't really doing NSH. 
So that all crumbled. Um, uh, and that's the point at which I started working on the BGP control plane. But notice that the L3 VPN solution, that's actually in the field and is being managed and, and so on because um, it uses so much of the existing technology. Um, where are we? Where will this go? Once we see people actually building, we'll get somewhere. I, I've seen research projects that are building service function orchestrators. So it's a very strictly SDN approach. Um, I have some issues about that with, with scaling. Um, so I think that the, the discovery in particular should be distributed, um, but then maybe the programming should be centralized. Thanks, thanks for answering. By the way, what's the thing on the right? That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a dog. That's a dog, look. It's a doggy's head. It's a, look, eye, tongue, nose. It, it's, it's, a net, it's, it's also my home network topology, yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to cut off the, the, um, the line because we're already okay. behind time, but so I'll just cut the mic line. So what cut the mic line means in IETF speak is those who are already standing up can ask questions, but nobody knew. Okay. <laughs> so um, ETSI Mano has been working on the NFV architecture and uh, overall abstraction for quite some time. So what is the fundamental uh, difference in the approaches between uh, that uh, trained and the what's happening in the ETF. Yeah, so the, the MANO architecture is very uh, targeted at, um, uh, I guess, lifetime orchestration, um, top to bottom, left to right, the whole, the whole picture. And part of that picture is service function orchestration. So I think if you took an SDN approach, you would be looking at Mano as a, a model. Um, what Etsy has not done is recognize a role for uh, a distributed control plane. And I think what's missing is some architectural work that looks at how do you build a hybrid. The ITF is historically really bad at doing that type of architectural work because we're all deep, deep dive engineers, not big picture people. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Sridhar from Huawei. So where do you see the use case of doing service chain in the network go uh, with uh, the uh, advent of quick? Uh, I mean, you see most of the traffic, application traffic will be using HTTP, and in the future, the transport will be quick where everything is encrypted right from the endpoint. So where do you f see this use case fit? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really don't know where, where, to, where to start on, on which bit I, I, I like least. Um, if you, as a end user, want service functions applied to your data, and your data is encrypted to the level that those service functions cannot be applied, then you will suffer and you will have to make the choice. Um, and you know, it's, it's an interesting challenge, the firewall, the quick enabled firewall. I want to stop bad packets coming in, but all of my good packets are encrypted to the level that they cannot be checked to see whether they are bad packets. Uh, I don't know that there's a good answer at the moment. Um, maybe what it will do is push all the service functions all the way to the, towards the source so before a packet is encrypted, all the functions have to be applied. Is that good? Mm, probably not. Oh, so another thing that Quick enables is it enables the flow to, to be flip-flopped all over the network. Now, applying service functions in the middle of the network when, the, when you've got no idea where the packets are is also going to be hard. Adrian, I see that the IETF has an NFV working group as well. So are they leveraging the work done here? I mean, uh, how do the two work together or not work together? So, um, the, it's a research group, okay. the NFB, and so it's in the IRTF, and what they are doing is looking 
at uh, problem space and architectures for NFV. And so the, the Mano uh, picture that was talked about before, okay. that finds its way into the NFV research group. And the idea is that a research group will spit out new topics for standardization. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a real good question. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Adrian. I've got a, actually, I want to talk to you about that metadata thing. I have a potential nail that's, that you may have the hammer for. So, so great. Well, everybody, a hand for Adrian and a wonderful talk. Um,